Hola a todos, how we doing? Welcome to World Cup Edition Persuasion Class. As you can see, I got my USA jersey on, getting ready for the game that begins in about an hour. Fired up. So while I'm, while we the game is waiting and all the pregame stuff is recording, let's get to your questions here. Uh, I apologize that these questions are a day or so later. Uh, we had a lot hard time getting back from the trip. But I wanted to answer these set of questions, and I'm hopefully going to answer this week's set of questions before the 4th of July weekend. And things are progressing well. Ready. Carla starts us off with a discussion of the Mormons on her topic talk. Uh, interesting story there. Uh, sidebar comment, comment. The Mormon church is building a huge temple, church, whatever they call it in downtown Philadelphia. So I guess I shouldn't be surprised if we see someone helping me out when I'm doing some guarding. Asking to help out when I do some guarding. The reading seems to suggest that we should listen to our initial first wave of feeling over a given topic. However, there are studies that show that emotion is what's in our head are not always connected. And often, more often than not, we should listen to our heads and not our hearts. What are your thoughts on this? Well, there is no question that emotion is a problem. And this book, and I don't think the Made to Stick book is much, although I have to think about that for a moment, do not deal with his motion, emotions as much with regard to persuasion. Usually what happens is, is the emotions get in the way. This book right here, The Art of Choosing, which is one of my decision-making books, this spends hundreds of pages on emotion. This one spends hundreds of pages on emotions. But every one I say they spend hundreds of pages on emotions, it's how our emotions deceive us or make us pick irrational choices that are not rational. And it could influence our decision-making process. You know, many times salespeople or other people will pull at emotions to get you away from the logic and it's easier to persuade someone emotionally than it is to persuade them logically you notice that attorneys are always pretty much boring and courtrooms are always boring because they know if emotions get involved they can be get pushed off their game mr christopher Seven Night Stand, it seems like T-Mobile is doing their best, whatever they can do, to target young. The idea of a seven night stand of a, instead of a one night stand is a little suggestive, but... Developing strongly and deeply rooted commitment and consistency requires a fair amount of time. What is the best way to develop commitment and consistency in a short amount of time? Especially when changing a long standing view or stance. You know... Everything in the chapter, and that was a long chapter, by the way, everything in the chapter tended to, tended to um, point in the direction of a long amount of time. I'm not sure there is a shortcut to this process. You know, If you look at the academic studies that were done, it's almost like they build up to the commitment. There's no instant commitment. There's no love at first sight, you get married the next day, Elvis is there presiding. You know, this is, you get them to start saying one thing, and then once they start saying that, you get them to start believing or writing something else. Um, I don't think there is a short-term kind of a scenario. And my suggestion is, is for you guys to do a couple Google searches, and this would be a spectacular thing to add to the thread. But I don't think it's there. Alexis, NBC Universal, and this consistent brand image was part of Alexis's topic talk, and I'm going to come back to that in a second. Are there any ways to overcome the perception of others who think that a person may be inconsistent or uncommitted? Are there also ways to get people to become more committed to a cause or product after they change their stance? proven to be inconsistent. You know, the one of the books that I read earlier this year was called The Power of Habit. 
And the whole idea behind the power of habit is consistency. Doing the same thing, and as you do the same thing, you know, when you back out of your garage, you constantly do the same procedure so that you don't accidentally back into your wife's minivan. Okay, yes, I backed into my wife's minivan because I was in a rush and I forgot to look. Sorry. You know, so I was inconsistent in that regard. Now, perceptions are hard to overcome. The only way to overcome a perception is to prove otherwise, and again, that takes time. Chances are the inconsistency aspect is, you know, it's, it's something that that story has to be rewritten. And there, it's, there's no easy way path to make that rewritten. Um, is there a way to get more people to get committed to a cause or a product after they change their stance? You know, it's interesting that it's very difficult to get people to change their mind if you try to get into an argument with them. You know, it's almost like you get an argument with your roommate, you know the roommate's wrong, the roommate knows that they're wrong, but they continue to argue it because it's either saving face or that's what they initially said so they're going to keep backing it up even though that they're wrong. You know, and chances are they may or may not ever really give in. You know, you kind of have to say, you have to give them an out. If you don't give them an out for them to say face, to say, okay, look, da 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 da, then guess what? They're going to say, they're going to stay consistent to what they originally said, even though that they were wrong. Now, in Alexis's topic talk, she was talking about NBC Universal and them trying to be more consistent within their brand image. And the whole concept of a brand is a study of consistency. A brand by definition cannot be everything to everyone. So Apple for instance, you know, there's been a lot of criticism on Apple about them buying this headphone company Beats. You know, it doesn't fit with Apple, they've never bought a brand, they never bought a company this large, yada 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 yada. But in reality is Apple is a premium brand, yet Apple wants to sell a $200 iPhone. Well, Apple can't sell a $200 iPhone, but they can sell a $200 Beats phone. You know, it's the same way BMW tried to have a $20,000 BMW, and they didn't want to do it, so they bought Mini. You know, the idea of having a $20,000 BMW and having an $80,000 BMW, you know, there's there's some inconsistencies there with the brand. You can't have that much quality on a BMW level at $20,000. You can have a Mini. You can have a Beats phone. But Apple doesn't want to have a sub... Not, it's not, Apple, you know, it's the same way we have Toyota, Lexus, and Scion. You know... Each brand can be consistent with its own brand ideology. I think that's why they're buying Beats. And Universal's trying to stay consistent within their brands, which was Alexis's uh, topic talk. Tiffany, besides defending against the automatic, consistent committal through feelings in your stomach and heart, are there concrete ways to change your stance after previously committing without ruining your reputation or being flaky. Well, I don't know about ruining your reputation or appearing flaky. You know, perhaps you apologize. Perhaps you could say, look, I thought I rethought this and I think this is a better way. You know, um, staying consistent even though you're wrong and putting yourself in a worse spot, I don't think that's the most optimal strategy either. You know, you could just come clean you know now politicians have a very hard time dealing with this and I'm gonna stay away from politicians for a second because we have more um, people down here with politician things more topic talk things with politicians I was trying to think of something else but if you're you could be consistent to always saying okay I'm gonna make the right call whether I'm right or wrong and then you're consistent within that regard. 
you know, staying consistent that you have to be right all the time. I don't, I don't know about that. Okay. Mr. Joe, do your commitments match your convi convictions? This is a Harvard Business School, Harvard Business Review um, article. Love Harvard Business Review stuff. Joe asks, do you think the lowball technique should be considered as a part of the overall marketing mix when developing a marketing strategy? Depending on the brand, the lowball technique might be better. Uh, but like a Ritz Carlton doesn't need a lowball technique. You know, certain brands don't need, you know, Tiffany does not need a lowball technique. And when Tiffany got into lowball technique, and they were, they were doing that little locket thing there for a while, and they were doing that little bracelet thing there for a while, that for 100 to $200, anybody could walk into a Tiffany store to potentially buy something Tiffany. Um, the margins were so low, and none of those customers turned out to be long-term customers that all they ended up doing was cheapening the brand. So there's certain high-end brands that the lowball technique is not there. But in the the idea of a lowball technique, when there's higher risks, such with services, lowball techniques or free trials or free offers or major discounts might induce trial. You know, because with services, services are harder to do deal with than products. Products you can go to a store and kick, feel, touch, try. You know, you could have a neighbor talk about a service, but you can't go over to the neighbor's garage and play with the service, you know, or try the service. Are corporate mission statements a form of commitment and consistency principle? And do they, in a sense, curtail innovation by narrowing the corporate focus? Um, a good corporate mission statement, I have the phrase over here, buy-in, you know, as unfortunately a lot of mission statements are just fluff you know but there are many companies that the mission statement is true to what the corporation is is and you read the mission mission statement the firm and the mission statement and the actions of the firm match with the mission statement employees buy in there is your commitment and consistency principle this is the firm this is how we've always behaved it's part of our mission yeah do they con curtail innovation by narrowing the corporate focus? I, I don't know. I don't think so. Um, you know, if it depends on what the mission statement is, it depends on what the corporation wants to do. But there are a lot of firms that do innovate and realize after the fact that, okay, this was our mission statement, but we're doing this now, and this is where the marketplace is, and this is where competition and, mar and consumers have pushed us in this direction. Let's rewrite our mission to fit who we are now. Let's rewrite our mission given what we want to be or where we should be given the market opportunities. You know, people people update the mission statement. People change the mission statement. People uh, firm sell SBUs by other SBUs and focus the firm a bit more. You know? Okay. Leah. I've noticed that when Cialdini lists reasons for examples, he usually lists just two. On page 67, when we was talking about the Magic Act, there are two declaration advantages. On page 79, the inner choice. There are two puzzle examples. Is this a tactic? Um, is there some psychological reasons to he rarely uses three? Uh, to be 100% honest with you, my knee gut juck gut reaction is, is this is an editorial thing. I don't think this has anything to do with persuasion along the lines. Um, nowhere in this book or any of the other persuasion books or made to stick do we see that there needs to be one, two, three, or five things to be persuasive. Um, I think this is just him coming up with examples and instead of having just one, he gives two. You know, There are other parts in the book where he just gives one. There are some parts in the books where he gives none. So I don't think there's anything there, to be honest with you. Can you touch a bit more on the American and Asian students who took the school and social relationships survey? I'm not quite clicking to why students from the more collectivist society would not take the second survey. Would they not want to provide more benefit to the group or to the society? You know, that's a very good question. Let me hit pause for a second real quick. Okay. Back. Um, I took another quick look, and 
I didn't see this either, you know, with um, Cialdini being very clear to this particular issue. Um, I do know that commitment and consistency, the effect of commitment and consistency, as strong as it is, is as strong as commitment and consistency is in individualistic cultures like ours, like the UK and Western Europe, um, Australia, it's even stronger in collectivist societies. So uh, this is something we need to look into. Maybe this is something we can follow up on with regard to our uh, threads in Blackboard. Okay, Lynn. World Cup likes Luis Figo and rooting for Portugal. Um, this isn't necessarily a question, but more of a comment. You know, Lynn was talking about in her topic talk about um, compared to with the betters, those Japanese fans seem to be much more objective and immune to the rule of commitment and consistency. Well, I, you, you did mention that some of your friends, people that you do know, do make these bets even though that they thought the team would lose. Um, emotions tend to get in the way. Group think if everyone else is doing it, you want to stay consistent with all your friends and family members, so you might wager a little bit as well. Um, sidebar comment, I thought Luis Figo, after his last World Cup play, was going to come play in the United States, and instead he went to the Middle East. It would have been awesome if he would have came to the MLS, but he got a much bigger offer from Bahrain or Qatar or one of the nations there. To play in their league. You know. Okay. Ahmed. Hillary. Wants the 2014 Democrats to run on Obamacare. Now. As we saw in some of the threads followed up to this. Um, you know. Hillary needs to stay consistent with who Hillary is. Not only does she support Barack Obama while he was president and on the run-up to Obamacare not only did her husband also help campaign a ton with Obamacare and has been one of the strongest defenders of Obamacare um, this was Hillary's main thing that she wanted to do when she was in the White House herself and her husband was president so she has to remain consistent here now I think, uh, to really get to Ahmed's question here, this question doesn't really have anything to do with the article, but do you think one of the reasons the American public tends to re-elect presidents to a second term in office is because they want to be viewed as consistent in commitment to a prior decision? Um, my flip-flopper thought is politicians usually get burned for being flip-floppers. Politicians have to try to keep their brand as consistent as possible. This was actually an issue that... Um, Mitt Romney had explicitly in the last campaign because he actually the Obamacare was built off of the thing that he built in Massachusetts and then all of a sudden he was against it when he went to run for president and needed the votes of all those uh, other red states so that flip-flopper thing really hurt him on that issue and a number of other issues and other politicians get burnt this way but to answer this question here with regards to um, you know these are not the actual percentages, but think about it this way. 25% of the country votes Republican. 25% of the country votes Democrat. 25% of the country doesn't vote. And 25% of the country decides every election. These are the independents that usually vote with this thing. Okay, The independents tend to look at what's happening around them if the economy's doing well and things are fine stay the course let's stay consistent re-election is pretty much guaranteed no ifs ands or buts um we had a situation between 2003 4 and 5 where it wasn't necessarily the economy that was the number one decision but the fact that the United States was involved with all these external wars, conflicts around the world, that people thought that the guy in the White House should stay the guy in the White House. 
and let's stay consistent there. Usually what happens is, is when there's a switch, it's because there needs to be a switch. You know, if you think about in 2000, 1980, uh, Jimmy Carter was having a hard time with the hostage situation. The economy was in very bad shape. Uh, and then, then we had two years of Ronald, two terms of Ronald Reagan. Well, then Bush Sr. became president, and his approval ratings were the highest approval ratings of any president in the past 50 years. And he didn't get reelected. And he had a situation where the economy tanked after the Panama and Gulf War won. And as popular as he was, and as well liked as he was, people didn't want to stay committed to that. They wanted to change. If you look at the last presidential cycle, you know, the Republicans got blamed for the financial meltdown, pretty much. They were in office. So, it, you know, Barack Obama got elected. And the economy did approve, improve substantially, but enough people said, let's stay the course here. He got a second term. You know, it's very interesting when after the second term and we have two Democrat and Republicans running that were not previously in office when things get really interesting. So I have no idea what's going to happen in 2000, you know, 16, and it's going to be interesting. Felicia, companies can no longer afford to ignore their social responsibilities. I think firms, it is some peer pressure, okay? I, I agree here, but I think the pressure is not just coming from them, it's also coming from Wall Street. It's coming from other directions. There are some firms that do social responsibility just for the PR. And there are other firms, uh, the example I think in your topic talk was about Coca-Cola. Pepsi, for instance, does a lot of social responsibility, but they do it more for their balance sheet. They want to be more green because they want to save energy costs in the plant, so they take the plants off the grid. You know? I think firms are doing more of the triple bottom line, that it's just not an environmental impact, not a social impact. But we also talked about social, environmental, and the financial bottom line. And those three bottom lines together are getting people to go more in the CSR direction. And then when you have enough firms such as Apple and all these other companies that are putting a CSR report up on their website, on the main page, then we're starting to get some group pressure from outside agencies such as Greenpeace to say, okay, look, this is a social responsible business doing as best as they can. It seems as though we keep our promises and commitments because we hear so much about what others think. It's possible, you know, it's not only what others think, but it's also that internal dialogue we have with ourselves. We want to remain consistent. We want to remain consistent to ourselves. We want to tell ourselves cons that we are consistent, but we also want other people to tell us that we are consistent as well. As well. Okay, Gisela. Now we're talking about overseas again. Would you say that in general, the desire to be consistent overrides the desire to make the right decision? I would say that consistency interferes with us making the right decision. The desire to be consistent I don't think it overrides, but it certainly impedes or interferes with the desire to make the right decision. Because your knee-gut reaction is to be consistent, not to necessarily make the most optimal choice. Based on this article, Obama chose to what he thought was right by deferring from using military force at the expense of his image and consistency. Well, Obama ran on his first term that he was against the Gulf War. He was against invasion. He wanted more dip, the, in, you know, and he wanted to pull troops out from around the world. Um, Obama's MO was not ever really military first. I, I have a feeling that he's trying to be more consistent to what he, what he ran on and what he has said in the past. And he's really not been the first to use force at any time, really. I mean, other than going to get Bin Laden, I mean, pretty much everything else, 
He's tried diplomacy. All right, Praveen, the White House whip. And Praveen watches some House of Cards. I just started the series last week. I'm only on episode five or six. Are dictators considered consistent? Uh, we had a similar question, not from Praveen, but in the first video, that force, if you have, we talked about carrot and stick. If there's a stick, if we have a dictator, you don't feel the commitment and the consistency if you're forced to it. You don't feel the reciprocity, the indebtedness, if you're forced to it. Um, they may or may not be consistent, but the feelings towards a dictator are not the same as they would be towards a leader that are doing it maliciously, you know, on their own. They claim that their words are always right. Their values and beliefs must be followed and supported by the citizens. If their deeds, beliefs, and words match, does this mean that dictators have a high level of consistency, thus resulting in having high levels of intellectual strength? I really don't think this applies with a dictator because everybody knows that they're a dictator. And if they're consistently good or consistently bad, we know that they they can do whatever they want. They're not doing it because they want to. They're doing it because they can. Um, and you have to obey. Okay, Kenneth. Housing, the American dream. So in Kenneth's topic talk, he was talking about ownership versus renting. We have a situation now where pendulum's swinging a little bit. Job prospects are getting a little better. The housing market is starting to wake up a little bit. Considering the visibility of home ownership in the wake of housing collapse, I'm sure that's what that meant, will the drive to commit to housing market as an investment ever return to its previous level? I'm sure that there are still investors in the market now. Um, I'm doing a consulting project with one. My brother-in-law is an attorney. He does all kinds of stuff like this. Um, I don't know if we're ever going to get the irrational exuberance as we had before. Um, bubbles don't go away. We know that bubbles are cyclical. Now, uh, something else to think about with regards to the American dream, you know, in the U.S., the norm is home ownership. People prefer to own their homes. They don't mind having the mortgage. And that is a consistent narrative, you know, pretty much post-World War II. You know, you do want to have your own home. And if you keep hearing that and all your friends around you and all the neighborhood around you is all home ownership, you then desire or strive for the consistency, the narrative of what everybody else does. And renting becomes the outlier or not the norm. And most people like going towards the norm and being consistent with the overall narrative of what's happening in the marketplace. The American dream, buying your own house. Travis, he asks, when Cialdini describes how some commitment decisions grow their own legs, can that be considered similar to an escalation of commitment of businesses in business, where efforts are continually made in a failing project or venture? Well, let me take this in two parts. When we're talking about growing their own legs, um, I like to think about a value proposition, that more things become valuable to someone, and therefore the low-ball, attractive one that started the scenario, well, guess what? There were other value propositions that supported this particular argument, and the low-ball argument goes away. So if we think about the Japanese auto industry um, here in the US, it was the case that Toyota and Honda were lowball scenarios. You know, it was cheap transportation. Small, cheap transportation, safe, good gas mileage. Well, Honda and Toyota over time grew their value proposition to the point where they were an incredible buy with incredible reliability for the price. Then the price kept going up, but guess what? It was still a really good buy. They grew their own legs. Now, can that be considered a similar escalation in commitment bias in business, where efforts are continually made in a failing project or venture? Well, 
some businesses it's more expensive to get an out to get out than it is to get to stay in you know when you think about the cost to end a project you know it may be you know the smaller loss would be to continue than it would be to completely stop you know we have to think about the balance sheet there Sometimes management are just blind and they're making a dumb decision and they're pushing everyone into a failing project. That could be the case as well. All right, Mr. Chris, he's going to wrap us up. Dr. Dano, do you believe that written statements are a holistically effective way in bringing about genuine personal change? There have been multiple studies. Some have been highlighted in the book, and yes, they do work. Finally, under commitment and consistency, where does the concept of persistency falls? Does it go hand in hand with this chapter? And the answer again is yes. I already mentioned earlier that habits are being habitual. I read that book, The Power of Habit, by uh, Nicholas, somebody from the New York Times. You know, those habits help you maintain a consistent pattern over time. I would say yes. Okay, everybody, um, please let me know if there are any further questions. I hope this was helpful. And let's go USA and see if we can get a win. I'd love for them to play Argentina. Have a good one.